Hello and welcome to the National Oceanography Centre's Into the Blue podcast. I'm your host, Dr Zoe Jacobs. Today I'm joined by Dr Jenny Brown to find out all about some of the approaches and methods of protecting our coastal communities. Thank you so much for joining us today, uh, Jenny. It's really good to see you. Um, before we start getting into it, I wondered if you could tell us a bit about your background, your career at NOC, what kind of projects you've been on and things like that. Oh, thanks for having me, Zoe. Um, so I've been a coastal oceanographer at the NOC for the last 15 years. Uh, this has been my only real job since leaving uni, to be honest. So um, I must love what I do. <laughs> and my projects have been looking at flood and erosion risk, how we understand processes and working with local authorities to get our research out into the real world. Okay, cool. So it sounds like you've worked on quite a few projects that involve coastal resilience, which is our topic for today. So um wondering if you could tell us um so historically how has the uk managed coastal hazards um, what kind of defenses have we put in place to protect our coastal communities well in the past we were very reactive so when there was large hazard events big floods so mm. the 1953 flooding events um, we reacted to those and that's when we started putting in sea defenses sea walls the thames barrier um, but as we move forward, we've started to realise we need much more sustainable ways of protecting our coastline. We can't keep building infinitely high sea walls mm. um, and everything has a design life. Uh, and with climate change, that design life uh, has a fixed period in time when it provides the level of protection that we require. Yeah, that's a good point, actually. I guess looking towards maybe more natural solutions in future, which I guess we'll come on to later. <laughs> um so what about protecting people living on the coast? So how you mentioned seawalls, how effective actually are they? Well, a seawall is very effective. Um, the problem is when you put a seawall in, then people get a sense of security and the community yeah. start to build up behind them. So if they do fail, then there's a larger community behind them that could be impacted by that flood event. Um, but going forwards, uh, we're, we're starting to realise that we need to live uh, with changing conditions. In front of seawalls, water levels are rising, so that means larger waves reach our seawalls. Larger waves means more beach erosion and also greater impact, so more waves spraying over the top of seawalls. So as we go around our daily lives, we uh, might live, live behind them, but we might also commute to work along coastal roads or coastal railway lines. Mm. We start to feel the impacts of flooding more frequently um, and we need to be able to forecast when extreme events are going to happen so uh, we yeah. can plan our journeys and um, protect our properties yeah i guess sea walls might be the most kind of familiar kind of coastal defense that we have in the uk for some people i grew up in portsmouth so living quite near to the kind to the shoreline i mean there's a massive sea wall that goes all the way along there so i'm very familiar with uh, those kind of things and um especially when there's kind of major storms coming in. I know quite a lot of people that actually go there specifically to watch the waves kind of crashing over the edge of the seawall. Um, and they take photos, which is actually really dangerous. I know, and that's what I was thinking. Yeah. Like, it doesn't seem like a good idea. Yeah. Um, but with, especially with climate change, right? So what are we, what are we anticipating to happen um, with climate change for uh, things like sea level rise and waves and things like that? Well, rising sea level uh, means the water levels are deeper in front of our seawalls. So that means uh, raise, waves are being raised up higher um, mm. so they can over the top go over the top of our seawalls. Yeah. Um, also, wind conditions are changing. Um, so if storm tracks change, onshore winds also blow dense plumes of spray over the top of seawalls. And that can be hazardous because um, large wave events can be carrying debris from the beach. Uh, maybe there's cobbles on the beach if they're picked up and thrown across the seawall. It could go through your window. They could go through your car yeah. windscreen if you're parked behind the seawall. Yeah, that's true. Um, so is is the kind of rising sea level and I guess increased storminess and more waves and things like that, is that just going to be a case of it's now just going to kind of go over the top of the seawall or is it actually going to affect the seawall itself? I imagine it's getting repeatedly bashed by lots of wave action, it might get damaged. Yeah, so a, a seawall will um, experience fatigue. Yeah. Um, concrete only has a certain design life as well. Mm, okay. And that's why local authorities monitor um, the condition of sea defences mm. and they have planned maintenance work as well. 
but also we're trying to change the way we manage our coasts mm. um so move away from the concrete start um having habitat restoration so where our beach levels are perhaps eroding um, we need to compensate for this in other locations as well and we're now trying to green the gray a little bit more um, mm. and use softer approaches to coastal management that's really interesting can you tell me a bit more about that give me maybe an example yeah um so in 2011 mm. uh, the dutch put in something called a sand motor now that is a, a mega nourishment so very often when we talk about beach nourishment maybe we go to the beach we kind of put sand deposits on the beach every five years uh, but that's quite invasive uh, for the habitats that are on the beach so the dutch um, did a mega nourishment which is designed to last 20 years and the waves and the tidal currents actually move the sediment from this large deposit and spread it along the coastline um, so people don't have to be there with their diggers on such a high frequency. That's really interesting. Have we got anything like that happening in the UK? Um, we do. So we have been looking at similar similar types of intervention. The problem is we don't have all sandy coasts coastlines <laughs> so we've got muddy coasts yeah. uh, gravel coast cliff mm -hmm. coast um so you don't want to put uh, the wrong type of sediment in a location and then mm. spread it um so it interferes with the natural habitat yeah i know um i've heard of um kind of habitat compensation for things like flooding maybe maybe more to manage kind of um river plains and things like that but um are there are there things that are kind of in the pipeline or even happening at the moment where we can, I don't know, transform a certain landscape into like marshland or something like that? Um, as like, as you say, like a more natural protection. Yeah, so um, Heskith Outmarsh in mm. the Ribble Estuary, which is just north of Liverpool, is a nice example. Um, so that's actually a habitat compensation scheme for right. engineered defences that went in in Morecambe Bay. Um, but by flooding farmers' fields, uh, mm. the salt marsh has grown up and now that acts as a, a buffer itself. So as a salt marsh establishes, that kind of absorbs waves like a big sponge at the beach, a mm. um, bit of a shock absorber, while it's also providing habitats for the birds. So it brings a, a lot more benefits. It's not just natural protection, it's also uh, benefits that are linked to health and well-being. It's a lovely place to go running or perhaps walk your dog. Yeah, kind of increasing the area, like our nature that we have. Um, that's really cool. So, the, cause, because I, traditionally I always think of our kind of coastal defences defenses as like the concrete seawall. So it's really nice to hear that actually we're moving, not always, I guess, but like in some areas where we can towards that kind of natural restoration, which I guess is better for everyone if, if it works. <laughs> um, that's really cool. So we were just saying that... Um, so sea level rise is, is going to present a much greater risk to people, especially those living on uh, on or near the coast. Um, how are we planning to manage that? Is there going to be kind of like better or increased forecasting? Um, well, we have we already have a very good um, hazard forecasting service. Uh, so that's run by government agencies. The Met Office yeah. have numerical predictions for the UK. The Environment Agency issue flood alerts. Um, but we're always learning um, new information, so a lot of research, we monitor conditions and as we get more understanding we can then improve the numerical tools that we use to predict yeah. what's going to happen. So we're always trying to reduce false alerts or missed alerts and try and improve information. And with new digital technologies, we're always wanting to get this information into more accessible sat-nav information. So perhaps when you're driving down the motorway, um, your your sat-nav will tell you that there's congestion and you reroute you. Or maybe your sat-nav can start telling you, well, a coastal road is closed at high tide because it's um, stormy on that high tide and reroute you as well. And that will help stop people driving or walking into flood hazardous zones. Yeah, and we talked about um um kind of commuting or um are affecting our vehicles or our trains and things like that um so i went to cornwall in the summer on the train and um as i was kind of going through dawlish i was kind of reminded of when that whole section of rail line just kind of fell into the sea didn't it um some of our listeners might remember that i can't remember how long that was five years ago maybe that was uh february 2014 gosh yeah, yeah. Oh my gosh, quite a long yeah. time ago then. Um, but I just remember it being quite a big deal at the time. Are things like that more likely to happen? I guess that, 
I guess the network rail have got quite a good forecasting system in place as well. Yeah, so while climate change impacts extremes, um, sea level rise is also changing the frequency of these more minor um, flooding events. So sometimes it's called nuisance flooding. So on the Mm -hmm. Dawlish railway line, you've got the waves overtopping the sea defence. If that happens more regularly, then there'll be more uh, train delays or speed limit restrictions, and that creates more transport disruption. So then there's a lot of uh, costs implicated Mm -hmm. with that. Um, So then they start weighing up the cost benefit of changing the seawall design or sometimes even relocating can um, when it gets too bad, can you actually put a a line in elsewhere? Mm. So when they're thinking about kind of the next hundred years, they will be looking at a range of different options and weighing up the costs and benefits of each. Yeah, that makes sense. Doing a kind of cost benefit analysis of all these different places. Um, Are there some places that just can't be protected? Um, I guess there's places you can inter- intervene anywhere you're willing yeah. to, but um, you've got to always look at the cost, the benefits. Yeah, of um, and sometimes uh, the benefits aren't just the flood damages and the monetary costs. It's also the health and well-being implement, um, Im- impacts as well. Yeah, exactly. As you, and as you just said, kind of sometimes relocation is actually just the best kind of way to manage that kind of situation. Can't manage everything. Um, is there anything people can do themselves yeah so um you might start seeing floodgates appearing in people's garden walls Mm -hmm. uh sometimes some of the small towns on the south coast um Mm. you'll see they've got flood floodgates in their doorways concrete barriers um and they're like secondary defenses so if a seawall hasn't been um, increased in height then overtopping can occur and the streets might become flooded so people are starting to protect their own homes um maybe the air bricks the vents in your your house perhaps you have them at a higher level maybe you have steps or a ramp going into your property in a higher doorway so, um some people are starting to have kind of electrics higher up so the plugs aren't mm. at ground level or maybe you have carpet upstairs but um not downstairs so people are starting to modify their homes yeah, yeah. kind of like forward planning because i think yeah. i've seen lots of um houses near the coast or on the news or whatever like protecting with sandbags that seems to be like the most traditional way to protect water coming in but i guess you have to think um if you're living in an area that is quite prone to flooding these kind of um floodgates which i've actually not heard of before what what do they actually look like they so they're, they're big no they're like metal barriers yeah um, so in a lot of modern seawalls um people don't like to park behind them uh, to have yeah. their fish and chips and not be able to see the sea yes. So you'll find big gaps along a seawall um, and if you look closely you'll notice there's a big metal gate uh, that can be shut when there's a forecasted flood event okay. um, to kind of maintain the barrier all along the length of the defence but then when it's nice and sunny they're open and people can actually see mm. the sea. Oh that's nice. Um, talking of barriers we haven't actually mentioned the Thames barrier but that is I mean that, how long has that been in place it's quite a long time, hasn't it? Yeah. Um, so people might be familiar with the Thames Barrier in London. Um, is that the kind of thing that's going to be needed in future to protect big cities? Um, well, it will depend if the city's on an estuary and whether um, they're, they're at a risk of surge. Some mm. cities are at risk of river flooding as well. Yeah. Um, so what we need is good forecast to be able to know when to close barriers. Yeah. Um, And also, because it's been there a long time, uh, with sea level rise, how long is it going to last? Do we need to change the barrier? Do we need to add other other defences alongside it? Um, Flood storage is something that could be looked into. Are there downriver locations where we can collect the water? Yeah. Gosh, there's lots, lots of things kind of being thought about and in the pipeline. It's really good. Um, and I know um, NOC is doing quite a lot of great work to uh, transform our coastal management systems. Um, can you tell us a bit about what projects we're involved in? Yeah, so uh, we're trying to develop a new sensor uh, that mm-hmm. actually measures in individual waves that go over the top of sea defences. So very often this type of information is collected in flumes, uh, but a flume within a laboratory doesn't quite get all of the the real conditions that interact (laughs) and all the different coastal locations um everything's very unique yeah um so by collecting measurements on site we hope to be able to um tailor uh 
hazard warning systems mm-hmm. to have site specific trigger levels so we know when conditions are actually hazardous um, and get a better understanding of what's going on and also use these the data that we collect as training data for new predictive tools that can be used to help forecast uh, what will happen at different locations. That's interesting so we're going more in terms of projects we're looking at more of a kind of uh, forecasting yeah, so I guess we're looking at observation-driven now casting. Okay. Um, so by having a sensor that can detect waves yeah. and then get the information online yeah. within 10 minutes, um, hazard responders or the general public can see that data um, mm. and can kind of plan around that and help make decisions as mm. an event is unfolding. Yeah, which I guess is incredibly important. Yeah. <laughs> um, is there anything um, we're, looking, we're doing at NOC uh, m- using models to kind of predict maybe future changes or anything else like that so we we do work a lot with the met office looking mainly at climate projections the larger scale and we don't work so much in the local uh, hazard forecasting services Um, so we look more at tides um, tide surges wave predictions around the whole of the uk coast and looking at the uncertainty in those projections Mm. going forward rather than the uh, 24 7 prediction schemes for flooding yeah I guess there is quite a lot of uncertainty as well. Yeah, makes makes life easier, doesn't it? <laughs> I know there is lots of the models I use as well. Um, so how, um, just to finish up, how can we educate the public on this? Well, uh, recently we've um, created a, a phone app uh, mm-hmm. that accompanies two guided walks, one in Penzance and one in Dawlish. Uh, the app is... is a, goes with about a 30 to 40 minute walk along those seafronts and it's communicating about coastal change Um, and it's a digital it includes digital art so it has Mm -hmm. a narration Mm -hmm. and also augmented reality so the user can actually see and experience hazardous conditions Mm -hmm. and see beach levels changing when they're walking along the coast on a sunny day and the aim is to get people to think about change and future mm. change um, and start to become more aware of what's going on and I guess take responsibility for staying safe when flood events do occur. Yeah, amazing. Well, I'm sure lots of our listeners will be interested in that. So <laughs> watch this space. Cool. Um, thank you very much for joining us today, Jenny. Appreciate it. So if you'd like to learn more about coastal defences or our coastal walk experiences, please visit our website at www.noc.ac.uk or click the links in the description. To ensure you don't miss out on future episodes of Into the Blue, subscribe on your favourite podcast app. See you next time.